Hey guys and welcome to Aussie Reviews. Welcome to Q&A for April and May combined. Now guys, I was out of action um, you know, for a few weeks there, so Mrs Aussie had to step in place and I hear that she did a really good job on the Facebook page. I kept an eye on it from time to time when I could and uh, yeah, I was really appreciative of uh, her doing that. Now, as for me, it was just a couple of medical things with regards to skin cancer stuff, guys. Um, more safeguard because of my previous history where I've had that melanoma. So, um, you know, anything that looks even half, uh, I guess, sus, you know, the doctor just wants to jump on and, and treat. So there was a few things that needed uh, doing and, you know, everything's been successful. So I'm really happy with that and I'm glad to be back. Now, uh, what else has been happening? A uh, few things have been happening. Uh, obviously, I've got a heap more reviews coming. Um, we've been doing a bit with regards to like the cooking videos, and they seem quite popular, even though you know they don't have thousands and thousands of views. Um, in general, the feedback from you know a couple of thousand views on each video has been really positive. So we're going to keep doing that because you know it's an important part of shooting and camping and all that sort of stuff as well. One of the other real big things that's happened um, at the time of doing this video is I did a video a few days ago uh, revealing my new Aussie Reviews rifle bag. So if you guys haven't seen it, <clears throat> this is it here. It's the prototype. So it's basically Australian oil skin on the outside. So it's got that real dries bone feel to it and it's large enough to clear most scopes on most hunting rifles. Um, if you want to have a look, have a look at the video as I say. So. Um, yeah, they were really popular. I mean, like, you know, I secured a hundred of them because obviously I have to pay the company um, up front. And then I put out the uh, pre-order to you guys. And wow, you know, like under six hours, all hundred of them were gone. And in the last few days since that's happened, I've just had numerous and numerous uh, people ask me about this and, uh, you know, wanting to be able to order more. So look, rest assured, um, at the time of doing this video again, um, I'm going to contact the manufacturer, try to secure another hundred of them and see how we go. There's so many problems at the moment with uh, all this whole COVID virus um, with delays and everything. So I'm trying to do the best I can there. Also too, I've got a pistol bag I've been working on because you know I've suffered that myself where I just want a really nice pistol bag to uh, take to the range. So that's coming as well. I'm going to show you that. So keep an eye out, guys. There's a lot of things happening on the channel. And of course, there's a lot of new reviews coming. I'm trying to do that as well as do all the merchandise side of things. Um, you know, So it takes time, but just bear with me and uh, I'll get through it all. Now, the other big news is um, I've uh, finally got a, uh, a new dog, a new pup. So he's not with me yet because he's too young. So if you saw on my Facebook page, I mean, I'll put the picture up here. Um, little Hank, as I've called him, is a purebred American uh, Staffordshire Terrier, just like Cooper was. And if you guys uh, weren't aware, any of you out there, that is, um, I lost Cooper last year in November, and uh, you know it was it's been real hard. And I need another dog to help me work on the farm because you know Cooper was my early warning system to wild dogs, and he also protected uh, the livestock as well from dog attacks. So. Um, you know, I need another dog to fill those shoes, but also fill the void in my heart that Cooper left behind, you know, when uh, when he left. So, yeah, things are good. You know, things are looking up and I'm really uh, looking forward to training Hank and getting him used to the farm and what he needs to do, etc., etc. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to that. So anyhow, guys, enough about uh, what's been happening. Let's get into uh, the questions. We've got a fair few because obviously we've got two months worth. Um, as I always remind people, guys, if you want to be a part of our Q&A series, by all means, you're more than welcome. However, you have to be a supporter on Patreon, which you can do from as little as a dollar a month. So you'll get my individual help and uh, you know responding to your uh, emails, messages, that type of stuff. So let's get into this month's questions. So the first question I got here is from Will, and he asks, uh, what are the good indicators that a hair is safe for human or pet consumption? And do you have to cook it um, if it's just for pet food? Well, no, you don't, mate, because there's a lot of people that do love raw diet for their dogs, especially. So you don't have to. However, things that I look for 
is obviously the eyes. If the eyes are cloudy and it's, it just doesn't look right, you will see it. It's not something you've got to look really hard. It will stand out. Another thing I find with rabbit or hair, uh, you know, if they have been poisoned or something is wrong with them, uh, their fur will be quite matted and it will, it will actually come out very easily. So if you grab a bit of the fur, it will just come out. Like it'll be really sort of loose if that makes sense, you know. Um, very weak so the other thing is too when you do cut it um, you know and in the glands and so forth if you do find any like pus pockets and things like that obviously something is wrong but usually those things will will actually really stand out to you so um, yeah that's what I look for mate um, and once again like obviously I cook the the meat thoroughly so if you are obviously um, you know wanting to, to wanting to give it to a pet well obviously they can eat it raw but with Cooper, my old dog, you know, I used to like to just cook it a little bit for him, you know, so it was still reasonably raw inside, but just cook it a little bit. That's That was just my personal preference on it. Next question I got here is from Cameron. He says, hi, Ozzy, uh, what scope would you recommend? I have a Sterling 22 and mainly chase rabbits at night with it. Uh, the one that I have is currently very old and it's time for an upgrade. And my budget is up to about $500. It's my favorite 22 that I own, and it's been reliable for years. Also, love your work, mate. Well, thanks for that, Cam. I appreciate that, mate. Um, honestly, okay, I've got five of these now, and most people will probably finish my sentence for me. The Loophole VX Freedom Rimfire Scope. Now, uh, three to nine by 40 is what I got, and it's got the little MOA uh, bullet drop compensators on it. So for a 22 using high velocity ammo with that, I sighted in at 50 yards, and then I usually find four little bullet drop compensators or four MOA down, it's right on at 100. So um, it's really good like that because when you're out in the field and you've got to make that longer shot, you can just lift the scope a little bit and you can see, or compensate I should say, you know, for that further shot. So really good. Uh, Price-wise, mate, $400. Unfortunately, everything with this virus uh, has gone up in price, and I know most, <coughs> excuse me, most of the uh, products for firearms have gone up between that 15 and 20 percent. So that's why I did that video uh, prior to um, you know the gun stores closing about get what you can now because I knew everything was going to go up. So uh, yeah, hopefully some people took advice there. The next question I got here is from Josh, and he says, Hi, Ozzy. I've seen your reviews on the Smith & Wesson 1522 and the Chris Defiance 22. I'm in the process of getting my Cat C license as a primary producer. I want a good, reliable rifle that will take all the knocks and still function well. Which rifle would you recommend, and should I get any upgrades? Thanks again for all the fantastic reviews. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Josh. Uh, yeah, mate, look, I've had both. I had the um, uh, the Smith & Wesson for feral pest control business, but I've got the Chris Defiance for the farm here. So, look, Chris Defiance is definitely better than the Smith & Wesson in my view because the Smith was, it was okay and it was a bit of fun, but it's really, it's all polymer. And to me, it just feels like a really lightweight, like Kmart toy, you know, in that regard, um, compared to a real AR. Now, when you go over to the Chris, I mean, you know, it's aluminium, it's 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 actual steel, you know, you, you got in it, it's not polymer, so it feels real. It's got the real weight and feel. So um, my preference would be for that, but if you've seen the review, obviously, that I've done on the Chris, you would have seen the uh, barrel issue that I had with the original Chris barrel. Now, that barrel is fine, it, it, it's, it can produce great accuracy, but what I've narrowed it down to now is the actual adapter, the 1022 barrel adapter that Chris use on their rifles. If it's not torqued to the correct setting, your accuracy will go right out the window. So I have actually put the original barrel on and achieved good accuracy, but then if there's any sort of movement in that barrel adapter whatsoever, it'll go right out the window again. So. For me, I mean, I solved that really easily. I just put a uh, KID uh, KIDD barrel on it and th that thing shoots brilliantly. So um, yeah, I would sort of recommend that as well. Uh, as for upgrades, mate, look, trigger. Any standard AR trigger is heavy as can be. You know, um, it's not 
like perfect for feral pest control on the farm or whether it's out on other rural properties. So what I would be doing is uh, getting one of the Geisley SSAE uh, two-stage triggers. Now there's the Geisley SSA and then there's the SSAE. So the SSAE is about a uh, pound lighter um, than the SSA. So all up, it breaks at about three and a half pounds from memory, so it's two stage. Just a brilliant trigger. I've had them uh, in my SR556 Ruger, SR762 uh, Ruger. I had it in the um, Smith & Wesson, um, and then obviously I've had in the uh, Chris Defiance, and I've also used them uh, you know, with some of the uh, manually operated AR-15 type firearms that are out there. So just brilliant. I cannot um, recommend that trigger uh, highly enough, I guess I should say. So uh, definitely put it on your import permit to bring one in because you know you won't regret it. I'm telling you, it is a massive difference. Next question I got here is from Madden. He says, hey, Aussie, loving the videos. I was watching your review on the Warwick uh, WFA1L and after seeing the changes you made uh, to that rifle, it got me wondering, how often do you keep the guns uh, you review for yourself? Uh, also, I just got my uh, fifth gun to add to my collection. I'm sure most people watching your videos each have a collection of guns. I was wondering how big your entire collection is and what your go-to guns are for pest control. Well, mate, it surprises a lot of people. You know, they think I've got an entire armory full of like 100 odd firearms. And it's certainly not because I've always um, been of the, uh, I guess the viewpoint that I like to just have a, a favorite couple of go-tos and I train, 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 train with them. In other words, use them and uh, get used to, you know, the caliber, the setup and everything like that. And that's all that I really need. So, um, yeah. So when it comes to review firearms, like I might get a loan from uh, some friends, and you know, which I greatly appreciate. And keep in mind, that's just close friends. I don't borrow firearms from anyone I don't know. It's as simple as that. Um, so, or what I'll do is I'll go and buy them. And what I have to do then is resell them. Now, obviously, there's a loss with that each time, but it's a loss that I've got to take to keep the firearms ticking over to meet the demand that you guys want to see. So they're the two things that uh, I'll do. I'll either borrow them uh, if I can, and then if I can't and I don't want to keep the firearm, well, obviously, I will resell it and then uh, you know take the loss from there. As for pest control, mate, um, honestly, the Benelli M4, that semi-auto shotgun I got, just my go-to, it's always with me, uh, getting around the farm and, I mean, whether it's wild dogs or some pigs come running out of the dam or whatever, it, it's just faultless. I can't fault it. Just an awesome shotgun. So, yeah, <laughs> I hope that answers your question. The next question I got here is from another Matt and he says, G'day Aussie, I'm shooting a uh, 243 WSSM with a PARD NV008 LRS scope. I'm considering putting a clamp on muzzle brake on it not because of recoil, but in the hope to help with accuracy. Uh, what are your thoughts on the clamp-on muzzle brakes? Uh, okay, mate, I, I probably wouldn't go clamp-on. That's just personally, I don't like that. I like the threaded ones because then you know it's 100% aligned, um, you know, and really you, you don't risk it coming undone as much as what a clamp-on um, brake is, okay? Uh, as for improving accuracy, I mean, I, I don't know about that it's only going to improve the recoil. What usually happens with the muzzle brake is, you know, at times it will shift your point of impact where you're shooting, okay? And I proved, I had proven that when I did the, um, what was it now, the Lantac uh, muzzle brake review. Um, you know, it did actually shift my um, point of impact. So honestly, mate, if you're not doing it for um, recoil management, I probably wouldn't do it because it's going to be really loud, okay? That's obviously what muzzle brakes do. So it makes it pretty uncomfortable for everyone, including yourself, when you uh, when you shoot it regularly. So look, if you can handle the recoil and it's shooting accurately at 100, so with that, I mean, you should be shooting three shots under an inch, no dramas at 100. If you can do that, mate, I wouldn't be changing at all. Next question I got here is from Gary, and he says... Uh, Hi team, I'm thinking of getting a rimfire. I know 22 LR is cheap and useful for very small game, but what about the other caliber offerings? Uh, what do 17 HMR and 22 Magnum offer versus 22 LR? Pros and cons, stay safe, Gary. 
Well, mate, um, a lot actually. Um, your 22 LR is just a great all rounder, whether it's just plinking, um, you know, or taking, you know, small varmints, I suppose. Um, you know, it's perfect for that. But when you want something with a little bit more oomph in it, yeah, you've got to look at that 17 HMR or the 22 Magnum. Now, most people know that I prefer the 22 Magnum over the 17 HMR. And why that is, is because the range of um, projectile weight that you can get for it. Okay, you can get everywhere from 30 grain right up to 50 grain. Now, you can get some lighter horny ones, I think we're about 25 grain, um, but I've never used them and I, I don't think I've ever seen them here in Australia. So, uh, but you can get a lot of 30 to 50 grain uh, projectile weights for that uh, caliber. Where you go to 17 HMR, you've got 17 uh, grains, you got 20 grains, that's it. Now, I do like the heavier uh, projectile weight in the 22 Magnum. I mean, we use 22 Magnum here on the farm when we're doing home kill. You know, you just walk up to a beast and you know, they're only about sort of 10 yards away, bang, you know, and their legs are straight out from underneath them. It's just got that real retain energy to uh, do the job. Now, if you're shooting like uh, rabbits, you'll be able to do it with the 22. Um, if you're shooting with a 22 Magnum, you're just increasing that accuracy uh, over distance, okay? So the 22 LR, once it gets to 100 yards, you know, it can be a bit iffy with the accuracy there. Um, you're not gonna have that real pinpoint accuracy. However, if you go like 22 Magnum, well, you've got more consistent accuracy at that 100 yards. So that may be an advantage to you. Very much the same with the uh, 17 HMR. Even though you know my preference is 22 Magnum, the 17 HMR ballistically is a fantastic caliber because it fires very flat. In other words, there's not much difference between you know like 50 out to 100 out to 150 yards. You know there's not that much bullet drop compared to obviously like a 22 or a 22 Magnum. So the only thing you got to be aware of, mate, is cost. Now. Thankfully, a lot of manufacturers are actually offering bulk packs now. Like um, I picked up some of that um, Hornady 30 grain V Max for the 22 Magnum in a 200 round pack, you know, which is just fantastic because it brings that price down. You're going to look at about paying about that 35 cents a shot, uh, depending on which ammo you get. Obviously, for the 22 Magnum, even the 17 HMR, where with the 22 LR, I mean, you can get it as cheap as. Well, in, you know, uh, looking at the current uh, price increases, maybe about that 10 cents a shot, but any of the premium stuff, you're looking at about that 20 cents a shot, maybe 25 cents. So um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit more, but it depends on what you're doing. So uh, yeah, mate, look, I would um, definitely consider what you're doing and get the correct uh, caliber there, but my preference is for 22 Magnum. Um, it really is a fantastic caliber. Okay, so the next question I got here is from Tony. He says, hi Ozzy, I currently have a Savage Model 110 Tactical with a 20 inch barrel chambered in 308. I wanna know if you know anywhere I could find tips on what to run, like in terms of reloading. Is there any specific uh, page or website that I can visit that has details on that sort of stuff? Or will I just have to trawl forums to find out what others are shooting? Cheers, Tony. Uh, no, look, <laughs> With that sort of stuff, mate, I mean, just general uh, reloading. I mean, you can go to like Sierra Bullets and get information from there. Um, you know, obviously ADI Powders here in Australia, I mean, they've got a hard copy manual that you can get a hold of that'll give you uh, loads to, to try with obviously 308. But if you want something that works specifically well in your rifle being the Savage, mate, honestly, I would have a look. Now, uh, Rusty from Southern Shooters, it's now changed impact dynamics. Um, lives and breathes this sort of stuff, like long range PRS uh, competition and accuracy is his thing. He's been all over the States, um, you know, learning and, and shooting with uh, other people that are right into this. And I'm pretty sure he'd probably have a load that uh, you could try through that Savage. So just look up Impact Dynamics. Um, you know, they're down in South Australia. So there's a uh, Facebook page and, uh, you know, they do numerous YouTube videos. Check Rusty out. I reckon uh, he'd be able to help you. Next question I got here is from Luke and he says, G'day Oz, in your opinion, what do you think a 2014 LA 101 22 LR would be worth? Do you still have yours and how's it performing? 
Mate, fine. Now, I've had three now because I bought the old man one as well. So, um, yeah, they are a good rifle. There's no two ways about it. Can be a little bit heavy out in the field. That's the only negative with it. But as for accuracy and, um, you know, continuing to be uh, reliable, mate, no problems at all. A fair price for one second hand, I reckon about $750. Next question I got here is from Gav, and he says, G'day Aussie, I was recently impressed by the gains uh, we were able to make in overturning uh, the firearm restrictions in Queensland. Congratulations to organisations, yourself and other individuals um, who actually <laughs> got up and did something about it. Uh, I know that there's still plenty of uh, work to be done. Um, other organisations um, and individuals as well uh, need to work on items um, that have been restricted either on or since 1996. Uh, knowing we still have a lot ahead of us and uh, yet a state election is fast on the way for Queensland, is there anything better that we can offer um, yet voting wise uh, than to put pressure on your local member or candidates? Um, as it seems we have lost priority with a number of parties and the support uh, at all of others. Separately, I love the review of the uh, Warwick WFA-1L. Uh, you can't do more than a clover or hole in hole with a hunting rifle. Well, thanks, Gav. Um, mate, look, it's a, it is a difficult one. It's something that I feel that we've got to really be diverse with and move with the times and change different angles to suit the conditions, so to speak. Um, and now this is what I'm talking about politically. Now, the way I look at it is, obviously I've said this for years, we've got the numbers. And that's what's so frustrating. And having all the pressure put on the uh, state government here in Queensland with these firearm shutdowns is just an example of what happens when a lot of us join together for the common cause. Now, obviously, we had the Dealers Association do a lot of work here in Queensland. Um, you know, we had the Shooters Union do what they could do. I certainly did what I could do as well. But it was a heap of people, like you guys at home, who actually sent the emails, made the phone calls, and created the noise about it to simply say, hey, I'm not happy with this. Now, it does get results, you know. Um, it doesn't get results if it's only done on a small scale, but on a large scale, it certainly gets results. So in saying that, I believe that there's still a valid, um, I guess, cause in going to your local member with issues on firearms and saying, I'm not happy, and if you support any of this, I won't vote for you. But the key thing is, having numbers with you, and I'm not talking about turning up with 50 people, although that would be good, but if you turn up with four or five other friends, all of a sudden that local member is understanding, yeah, look, there's a handful of people in the community that really aren't happy with this. But I think probably the best sort of tactic would be when these uh, elections come up, we've got a lot of candidates in the different electorates who really need help. And, you know, I know you yourself, Gav, will understand this, and I hope a lot of other people do as well. But the help that uh, you can give them is handing out how to vote cards on election day, uh, going around offering to put up some of their placards, you know, donating some money to them so, you know, they can afford uh, some Facebook advertising, that sort of stuff, you know. We all need to come together. So what we need is people who basically are leaders who are gonna step up to the plate in their electorate and organize other people to come and help them go and help that uh, uh, that candidate. I think that's a really positive way because I mean, you know, when you go into these um, polling booths on election day, I mean, you see the, you know, just line upon line of, of Labor volunteers, LNP volunteers, but you know, there's a lot of good parties that, um, you know, or candidates that really need a hand to be on those polling booths to help hand out those how to vote cards and really get involved. And, and I see that as the only way forward. I don't really know any other way, uh, you know, to do it. Um, this is the thing, we've got the numbers. Um, there's also plenty of good candidates out there, but we need to just swing and use our numbers to vote for those good candidates. And then there wouldn't be half of these problems in my view, because we'd actually have people in power. I mean, even like the Cata Party. I mean, those boys there are very supportive of firearms owners. You know, imagine if we had another five of them or, an, or another 10 of them elected here in Queensland alone. Um, you know, and this is, I guess, the one thing that really frustrates me, and I've said this before is, 
you know, like people will rubbish like Pauline Hanson, they'll rubbish the Cata Party, um, you know, they'll rubbish any sort of party that, um, you know, might not say, yeah, cat D for everyone, basically, you know. Um, but do you prefer to have them in or do you prefer to have the ALP or LMP in deciding on firearm issues? You know, so I hope people can see where I'm going with this. Um, I think that uh, shooters a lot of the time are their worst own enemy. I mean, they've only got to have one of these minor parties who does something that they don't agree with, whether it be uh, like, a, a, you know, perhaps uh, working conditions or, or something like that. Um, and then they just write the entire party off. But then you have like the LMP or ALP and you can just keep counting. You don't even have enough fingers on your hands to count the amount of screw ups that they've done and the amount of times that they've worked licensed shooters over. And, but it just keeps going. But then you have shooters who will say, Okay, but no, I'll still vote for them because bugger One Nation and bugger Cata Party and all the rest of it because they've done one single thing they don't like. Like, really? Like, really? You, you, you would prefer the ALP or the LMP to be, to be deciding your gun rights over the Cata Party, One Nation, or obviously Liberal Democrats. I mean, they're, they're the premium party when it comes to gun rights, in my view, here in Australia. But, you know, would you prefer those other parties or would you prefer the pro-gun parties or even semi-pro-gun parties um, to actually be in a position of power to decide what gun laws will and won't be in the future? So I think you get what I mean there. And I find that very frustrating, but I honestly believe that the answer lies with us getting motivated, getting in touch with our friends and that going, hey, what are you doing this Saturday? Let's go and help this candidate out. Well, let's go and have a talk with him. Let's see if he's on the same page as us and let's get involved. That's all it would take. And we would see massive changes here in Queensland and Australia wide if all shooters did that. Okay, the next question I got here is from John. He says, hi, Aussie. Do you have an opinion on 270 versus 7 mil 08 for deer in a lightweight hunting rifle? I reload and already have a 308. Uh, also, what lightweight hunting rifle would you recommend that you'd be hiking up a few hills with? Thanks, John. Yeah, mate, look, it's I've used both, and I can assure you the 270 hits harder, okay? Um, depending on the distance and the bullet weight and everything, but you're looking roughly about that 250 to 300 uh, foot-pounds of energy greater than 7 mil 08. So it's got some fair knockdown. The 270, um, you know, using obviously like 130 or 140 grain pills is a very flat shooting uh, cartridge. And honestly, when I think of deer hunting, and especially like, you know, in the US, the 270 is just rock solid, made its name as the ultimate uh, deer caliber. I mean, I honestly don't know any deer that you couldn't take with a 270. Everything from uh, chittle, fallow, red, right up to Samba Deer, you can do it with a 270. So that would be my preference. The 7 mil 08 look, you know, if you were running out of ammunition and you went into a local shop, you're going to find 7 mil 08 on the shelf or 270. You know, there's probably a bigger chance you'll find 270. I think 270 will be a little bit cheaper as well. I mean, I'd have to check the prices, but 7 mil 08 is one of those really Gucci calibers. And, uh, you know, it had the label of being the ladies 308 caliber. Uh, for many years because it was quite substantially less recoil over that of the 308. So um, look, I really don't see the point considering you have a 308 on going to a 7 mil 08. I just don't see the point. Um, you know, go to the 270 and you'll have just a perfect uh, deer hunting uh, you know, caliber. And as for the rifle, uh, the ticker uh, T3X light or super light, mate, that's the way I'd be going. You just want something that's reliable, it's lightweight, and it's going to work. If that's not in your budget, look at what I got uh, recently and did the review on was the Bruger Compact. Now, that's just a, a fantastic rifle, uh, very lightweight. I'm just not sure if it's in 270, though. I don't, I'm not sure. I'd have to check on that one, mate. Sorry, it just came into my head now. Um, but you know, any of those Ruger Americans are still pretty lightweight. You don't have to go for the compact model. You can just go for the full length model. They're very lightweight, synthetic, will take the knocks in the field. And obviously, you know, it's half the price of ticker. But if you can afford it and you go the ticker, you're just going to be guaranteed of just superb accuracy, ultra smooth action, and just reliability that they're well known for. 
Next question I got here is from Ellis and he says, Hi Ozzy, uh, we recently had a sentencing hearing in the Launceston Supreme Court and I was wondering if uh, this annoys you as much as it does I. The following charges received a 10 uh, month prison sentence. One count of breach of a uh, family violence order, one count of uh, possession of a firearm when not the holder of a firearm license uh, for the appropriate category, one count of possess ammunition when not the holder of appropriate firearm license, one count of possess firearm in contravention of firearms prohibition order, uh, one count of possess loaded firearm in a vehicle in a public place, uh, one count of possess shortened firearm, one count of breach of bail conditions, one count of drive whilst disqualified, uh, one count of evading police uh, with aggravated circumstances, and finally two counts of assault police officer. Um, this individual has so far had 112 charges and seven prison sentences and is only 26 years of age. He consistently acquires illegal firearms, when on bail, and sadly, I am uh, sure he will kill someone before he is locked up where he should be for a long uh, time. I wish our firearm laws actually had uh, some sort of impact on people like this and uh, didn't uh, persecute footy players for having a bit of fun with a straight pull shotgun on private land. Mate, 100%. I, Look, like, I agree with you. And I think that is one of the most common complaints. I mean, you've only got to look at different um, you know, news articles like online, like on Facebook and different social media. You know, people are saying and they're going off about these, what is in their view, um, you know, really weak sentences. Um, there's just no, uh, I guess, um, punishment that lives up with community expectations. And that's what people are complaining about. So, you know, you look at all that, yeah, 100%. I mean, you would probably look at that and go, well, yeah, there should be more. That person really needs to be put away. But, um, you know, what, what was it, 10 months? I mean, I, I, I don't know, mate. It's, it's a hard one um, because the problem now is when you have these really left-wing parties, um, you know, they don't seem to believe in, um, you know, doing that and locking people up and, and, and throwing away the key, so to speak. Um, and my case in point is, look here in Queensland, I mean, Shooters Union and the LNP both have um, been supportive of, uh, you know, steal a firearm, go to jail campaign, where basically if you steal a firearm or you're in, you know, if, if you are in illegal possession of a stolen firearm, then you go to jail for a minimum of three months. Now, from the information that Shooters Union have given me, They've said that the ALP here in Queensland have just pushed that back every time and, and just not agreed with it. So it's like, why? Well, why wouldn't you agree with that? Like, I think everyone pretty much would agree with, you know, putting people away who are really doing the wrong thing and who are a danger uh, to the society. I mean, you know, like you said here, like this person's got, um, you know, an illegal firearm, obviously. Um, it's loaded in a public place. Um you know, they've, they've obviously got ill intent with it. So, yeah, it just frustrates me, mate. It really does. But it comes back once again to people vote for these parties who appoint, you know, different magistrates and judges and things like that. Like, this is where it's got to change. If people are genuinely unhappy with uh, the results that they see, they need to switch the party they're voting for and start voting for people who are leaning a bit more right. Now, I'm not saying right-wing extremists or anything like that, but just a little bit more right on the uh, political spectrum so that you know there is actual punishment for these people who are a real danger in the community. So yeah, they don't care. I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you're telling me all these charges here. The obvious thing that hits me is this person doesn't care. What gun laws? They don't care. And this is what all us licensed shooters have been going on about for how many years now? You know, saying that like the whole, all the stuff since uh, 96, what's it going to do to improve public safety? And that's an argument or a viewpoint that I certainly support and share as well, because these people don't care. And you've only got to look up the results in court and you can clearly see they don't care. But everyone uh, in you know the positions of power just seems to put their head in the sand and go, oh no, we've got great gun laws, you know, <laughs> they don't need uh, 
They don't need uh, loosening. We just need to tighten them even more and more. But it's only us, the licensed shooters, in my view, that, that cop the tightening. So, mate, 100% agree with you. Um, it is very, very disappointing. As for the way to change it, we've got to vote the right people in. That's the only way. Next question I've got here is from Sean. He says, hi, Aussie. Just a day before all this craziness happened, shutting down our gun stores, I picked up my first shotgun, the Dickinson T-1000 bolt action. Uh, haven't even had a chance to fire it because of this. Uh, as soon as all this has been lifted, uh, I'd like to put a red dot on it and um, wondering what your recommendation is. A budget of about 500 bucks. Thanks, mate. Look, people know I'm a little bit of an optic snob in the sense of I don't like Chinese or Filipino optics, and that goes for red dots as well, mate. Um, you know, if you do a search online, you'll see the problems that people have had with uh, these cheaper uh, Filipino and Chinese um, red dots. So my honest, like, I guess my top of the top would be aim point. That would be my top choice straight up, okay? Now, yeah, aim point's expensive, you know, and do you want to put that on on a, uh, a I guess, a cheaper shotgun in the, in the uh, spectrum of uh, shotguns? Well, yes, if you go for the entry model um, micro, the H1, uh, I think they're about 700 odd dollars around there, brand new, but I've seen a lot like on used guns, um, you know, coming up for around about that $500. So mate, keep an eye out because the A1, I mean, I've, I've had that on uh, two rifles myself. I had on a, um, uh, my SR762, 308, semi-auto, and I also had it on my SR556. So I had both of them. Um, on there, so two different H1s, and they just perform brilliantly. Absolutely no problem with it. So, you know, they'll take the recoil and everything else, and you've got quality that's made in Sweden. Like, it's just two worlds apart. So um, I would look at doing that. If 500's your max, have a look on uh, used guns or some of the, um, you know, the secondhand uh, marketplaces there, and I'm pretty sure you should be able to find a really good, um, you know, one in good condition for that price. Okay, next question I got here is from Mick, and he says, Hi, Ozzy, hope you're doing well in these tough times. I have always shot from my right shoulder and have just realized that I'm left eye dominant. Wondering if you would recommend changing to shooting from my left shoulder, as the target is certainly clearer at that side. However, my right hand uh, is the dominant hand, uh, so it is easier to cycle with that hand. Also, with uh, any future gun purchases, should I consider buying left-handed models? I suppose I would become used to it after a while uh, with practice. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Mick. Well, mate, there's a couple of things that I've been told about. Now, I've never had to do it myself, um, but this has uh, come from Tom Gresham over in the US. I remember listening to um, his radio program there years ago, and there was a caller with a, a similar issue. Now, uh, what a lot of people do and what was recommended at the time from my memory was to actually put a patch over your uh, eye, okay? So if you're... If you're wanting to change to be more right hand dominant, put that patch over the left eye and then you can start to train your brain to pick up with uh, your right eye, obviously being right handed. So um, yeah, that's an option. If you wear shooting glasses or glasses, you know, just like basically put some tape that you can't see through over that left eye and then, you know, start training and training and then see how you go from there. And then hopefully that should work. Um, if it doesn't, uh, if you want to try shooting left handed, by all means, give it a go. So, um, mate, that's the only advice I can offer you with it, unfortunately, because I've never had to uh, suffer it myself, I'm sorry. So, yeah, see how you go with that. Um, keep in mind, no matter which option you take, it's going to take training. You know, don't just go out to the range once and go, oh, this is terrible, it's not working. Give yourself uh, several chances at it to get used to it and then just, you know, obviously see how you go from there and then make your decision. Next question I got here is from Preston. He says, uh, what's your opinion on uh, 7 mil Remington Mag Aussie? Any chance you could do some videos on some of the entry level rifles in that caliber? Uh, mate, yeah, look, I possibly could. Um, the caliber in general is a very good flat shooting caliber. Um, if you're recoil sensitive and you want an actual Magnum caliber and you don't want to go to 300 Win Mag, well, you've got obviously the 7 mil Remington Mag, which is just a smidge more uh, recoil than 308. You're looking at roughly like 30 odd six, you know, same recoil there. Um, it's certainly under 300 wind mag um, and in between that 308 and 300, so around 30 odd six. 
Uh, as for price, mate, of ammo, it's not cheap to keep that in mind. But my question to you would be, what's your use? Um, you know, are you just looking, you know, just for a bit of fun at the range or, you know, have you got a specific hunting uh, need that you want to, you know, fill? Or, or what is it? Because, um, you yeah, know, obviously it's pretty expensive to run, um, you know, and after a while you will start to feel it on the shoulder, that's for sure. And if you're only hunting, um, I'm only just using this as a hypothetical, if you're only hunting, you know, and you want to go out and, I don't know, perhaps chase uh, deer or pigs or, or whatever, like, you know, there are other calibers that will do the job very adequately that are a lot cheaper and a lot lighter on your shoulder. So, um, yeah, that's just a question back at you just to consider there, mate. Next question I got here is from Gary, and he says, I know it would be a legal and logistical minefield, but would you uh, consider having uh, Patreon supporters over to your farm for a shoot? Then there's none of the lame rules we get at the SSAA ranges. Uh, I can definitely understand if you'd rather not have a bunch of randoms at your home, etc. Either way, just a thought I had. Love your work, bud. Well, mate, the short answer is no. I mean, um, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of people who donate a, a dollar a month and you have no idea who they are. Um, you know, insurance wise, I mean, you know, if someone's just coming onto your property, then if they're insured, well, look, that's fine. There, there wouldn't be too many uh, things there. But yeah, you just, uh, I, I guess, mate, you just don't want to open up your, your private life or private home to, you know, to people you just don't know. Next question I got here is from Will, and he says, um, Hi, Ozzy, do you just uh, shoot ferals, or do you use a combination of shooting and trapping to be effective on the farm? No, mate, I just shoot them. And the reason I do that is because, well, when I did have Cooper alive, um, he was my early warning system, you know, with wild dogs. Like, I'd know when they were around because he'd alert to them. Also, you know, I've got a number of trail cameras, um, you know, located around the property, so... Yeah, that also alerts me when they're around and I find shooting is the best uh, method because obviously I can get, uh, you know, multiple like dogs, for example, in one single encounter. Where with trapping, especially with dogs, I mean, you've got to go out, you set the dog trap and then that just gets to the one dog. So it's very labor intensive for just very little reward, if you know what I mean. So yeah, mate, that's all I do. I just control them with firearms. Next question I got is from Wayne. He says... Um, Hi Ozzy, a review on uh, Vortex Optics or your thoughts on the quality of their high-end scopes. Uh, even a full review um, on one would be awesome. Any chance of that? Thanks. Well, Wayne, yeah, look, I could, mate. Um, most people know that I, I really don't like uh, you know, Chinese and Filipino scopes, which the majority of Vortex Optics are. Their higher-end ones are made in Japan. So, yeah, fantastic. I mean, I, I wouldn't have any complaints or hesitations with that. Um, but yeah, look, if, uh, if I get the chance to do one, yeah, certainly would jump at it. Question I got here from Andrew. Uh, he says, uh, a while back you reviewed gel blasters, Aussie. Now some time has passed and these things uh, seem to have evolved. Uh, they are made of all metal parts and uh, shortly include gas-powered uh, pistols. Uh, with these advancements, what's your current view on how this uh, sport reflects on licensed shooters and public perceptions? Well, look, I've, I've always had the saying that, um, you know, with exposure comes normality, you know, and I apply that to the licensed shooting world. And that was more in regards to these cosmetic appearance laws. Now, I can see uh, gel blasters as having a positive um, effect on that if they're used correctly. Now, you know, if someone's going to be stupid enough to uh, dress up in camo clothing and sling a um, AR or AK gel blaster, and walk down the middle of uh, you know the mall in a uh, in a big town. Like I mean, you know, what would people honestly be thinking is going to happen if if they do that? And all it does is it just brings negativity, um, you know, onto all of that in general. And when people find out it's a toy, they go, oh, well, that's the reason we need cosmetic appearance laws so the public aren't scared. You know, it's. Not something that I subscribe to, that viewpoint, but um, yeah, that's what people out there would say. Um, to me, they're always a, a, a toy. They always uh, will be. I mean, firing a gel ball, I mean, how are you going to be killed from a gel ball? You know, uh, at the most, I mean, what if someone's stupid enough to aim it and uh, hit someone in the eye, then you possibly cause uh, some damage there. Now, um, 
I've always had the uh, viewpoint that air rifles in general, um, you know, shouldn't be requiring licensing or anything like that. No registration, you know, nothing. Um, because, you know, I remember as a kid, you know, getting around with an air rifle and shooting cane toads and all that sort of thing. Because the responsibility then comes back on on the, um, well, in my view, the parents, you know, to enforce a uh, strict upbringing where if you do the wrong thing, you simply get punished. But uh, that doesn't seem to be the way things are these days with a lot of people. And that's something that I completely disagree with personally. So, um, you know, where do you find the balance? Um, My view is um, you simply make uh, penalties harsh enough to send a deterrent to people who are doing the wrong thing. And, you know, we touched on this in an earlier uh, question I had from Ellis in this Q&A. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of my viewpoint on it, mate. Um, What it comes down to is to common sense and education. I mean, you know, I was 11 years old when I had my SKS rifle and 1,200 rounds of ammo for my birthday. You know, most people would just go, that's just out of this world. Well, not really, because, you know, I was a good kid. Um, If I did anything wrong with it, my father would have belted the living hell out of me. Um, And I knew that would have come and I would have lost my rifle. I'd never see it again. So yeah, I didn't go walking down, um, you know, to the shops with it or anything stupid. You know, I used it on the farm. I made sure I had a, uh, you know, a decent backstop. And yeah, you were just sensible and did the right thing. But um, this is what I don't like about uh, this real like left wing mentality of you know not having punishment, everything's easier. Um, you know, just rely on the government. If you do something wrong, it's not your fault. Like all this sort of stuff. I just, I don't know. I, I just don't agree with it at all. And I know there's a few other topics we're touching on here, other than what your question is. But I'm bringing it back to the answer there, mate. Is I just think as a society, we just need to change and start having a bit of common sense and. Uh, a bit of uh, responsibility for our actions, you know, I guess uh, forced upon us a lot more than what it currently is because these people are are doing uh, silly things in the society, like not just with gel blasters, but then everyone gets punished. And I I don't believe in that mentality. I believe in you punish the person, not not everyone. Um, But that's just my thoughts on it anyway. But I'd be, you know, keen to hear your thoughts further on what I said anyway. Next question I got here is from Steve, and he says, Hi, Ozzy, I've got two questions, mate. Um, first, I've been uh, shooting for quite a few years, and in regards to cleaning a centerfire rifle, I've always run my brass, uh, brush back and forth through the barrel in a somewhat scrubbing motion after applying some sort of copper solvent. Uh, I've watched all of your videos, including your beginner basics series, and note that when you practice, uh, just Uh, pushing the brass brush from the receiver to the muzzle only once, then removing the brush and continuing the process. Is there any uh, particular reason other than just habit that you do this? And uh, don't just keep the brass brush on the cleaning rod and scrub back and forth. Uh, No. Okay, well, first of all, I'll answer that one, mate. Um, No, definitely not. It's, It's not like habit or anything like that. What I find, and I mean, I used to use brass brushes and do a bit more scrubbing with them. But ever since using that foam bore cleaner, which I've used for a number of years now, after you leave that sit in that barrel there for about 20 minutes, it really just eats down a lot of that stuff and just loosens it right up. So all I find is with that brass uh, brush, just push it through once and it'll just loosen the rest of it up and then just patch it out. Um, That's what I've always done. I mean, look, I'm not a... You know, mad keen competition bench rest person where you know just it, you will just clean that out ridiculously super clean every single time i like to just have it clean um, and it continues to shoot accurate that's me i'm happy you know so that's sort of where i come from there and the second question from steve is about knives uh, he says i want a knife purely for skinning gutting and possibly quartering rabbits out in the field. Could you give me a recommendation on a top tier knife for this purpose? I was thinking along the lines of the Benchmade Grizzly Creek. Um, I'm happy to twist the limbs off manually. Regards, Steve. Uh, Honestly, mate, I can't see how you could go wrong, uh, you know, with that knife. I mean, obviously having the gut hook there, um, having the good uh, quality steel, it's just a really nice knife and perfect for doing, uh, you know, rabbits and hares. Uh, As for, you know, getting it, prices and stuff, I mean, look, shop around, obviously, but remember uh, Nebo Knives who import Benchmade here into Australia, 
look, they're the ones who have approached me, no catches, nothing. They will give you 10% off the knife. Um, you know, if you put in the discount code Aussie 10, so O W Z I E 10. So you got nothing to lose. There's no catches, no gimmicks, nothing. Just put that in on their website and uh, you'll get that discount applied. So like I said, you can shop around, but you know, remember that discount and uh, it helps a uh, supporter of the channel in the sense of someone who, you know, wants to offer us discounts. It just helps them out. So I get no kickback from it, nothing. So just put it in and get yourself a knife, basically. Next question I got here is from John. He says, uh, G'day Aussie, good to see uh, you back on deck and hoping all went well. This question relates to the ticker TAC A1. Given that there are restrictions on these rifles, particularly in New South Wales and a few other states uh, where folding stocks are prohibited, are you aware of any butt stock conversion kit that can fix a stock so that it does not fold? I don't want to have it permanently uh, pinned. I just want to be able to swap it out when traveling in a state. Your suggestions will be much appreciated. Thanks in advance. Well, mate, uh, they do sell the uh, Ticker A1 TAC with a uh, fixed stock here in Australia. So, you know, that would have come in obviously through Beretta Australia and then out to the dealers from there. So uh, I don't know off the top of my head how much that would cost, but you'd have to get in touch with your local dealer, ask them. And if they don't know, then obviously they could phone Beretta and, uh, and ask about it. So then you've got a fixed stock there that you can swap out. I mean, you may need to use a couple of tools, obviously, to do it. But um, yeah, I don't see why you can't do it and have that as an option, you know, uh, when you're going into areas where folding stocks are prohibited. Next question I got here is from Matt and he says, Hey Aussie, I was just wondering if there's a scope uh, for hunting out there that has a good quality glass that doesn't break the bank somewhere around the five to six hundred dollars or less. I can't seem to find a really basic scope without fancy turrets or reticles uh, that has good clear glass and sensible hunting magnification, no more than 12 power. I would be putting it on a ticker T3 and 243. Mate, honestly, I've reviewed one, the loophole. Um, uh, VX3i 3.5 to 10 by uh, 40 scope. Now I've written the code down here for you. It's LE170680. $775. Honestly, I know that I, I do like to promote loophole because it's just a good benchmark of a uh, scope. You know, like I've had no issues with them at all. Sure, it's not the same as uh, Schmidt and Bender in my view, but it's still pretty damn good quality. Have a look, I've done the review on it, mate, and it's just a fantastic bit of glass that would look great on your ticker. All right, guys, that's it for the Q&A. Hope you enjoyed watching it. So till next time, we'll catch you then.